Good evening. Welcome to the debate. The topic is religion good for society? This is Elizabeth Knapp. My name is Matthew Martyr. We are the president and vice president, respectively, of the Center for Inquiry Club at Broward College Central Campus. For those of you who aren't familiar with CFI, um, it is an organization that is promoting free thought, free speech, and the freedom for inquiry. Also, supporting science, secularism, and skepticism. wanted to do this event um, is, uh, and our supporters, which we would like to mention, um, our supporters are the, well, for this event, are the Center for Inquiry Organization, National Organization, specifically the chapter of Fort Lauderdale, FLASH, which stands for Florida Atheist and Secular Humanists. They are a local um, secular community of South Florida, and then, of course, Calvary Chapel of Fort Lauderdale. Um, if I could please have uh, Darren, Bob, and Eric, and, um, and anyone else that was involved in uh, the back, kind of like in behind the scenes, of, it stand behind the scenes uh, of this debate, if they could please stand and be acknowledged. I would just like to publicly thank them for um, That, that came with putting on this event. Anyways, uh, the, reason why, the reason why we wanted to do this event is because um, humanity has come very far, right? And the reason why we've been able to come this far is through questions. Not only questions that are comfortable, but some questions that might be uncomfortable. Like uh, when Galileo was questioning the geocentric model. We, uh, we need questions to bring humanity further and to progress. And uh, that's one of the things that Center for Inquiry is about and, um, and supports. And that's why, that's why we're trying to do this event today, it's for, that, it's for that reason. So we hope that um, you get something out of it and uh, that, you, that you enjoy this event. We are not done. <laughs> Afterwards, there's a reception. Uh, it's held around the concession. So there's going to be 45 minutes of debate and then 45 minutes for questions. And afterwards, if anyone wants to talk, introduce yourselves, become friendly, meet up at the concession stand. Uh, also, there's extra credit for Mr. Cusco uh, for the poll after the debate. So if you are here for extra credit, make sure you do that so you get it. And um, Elizabeth's going to invite and introduce our debaters. Um, um, also, I would like to uh, make an announcement about Darwin Day. It's going to be awesome. We're going to have uh, guest speakers like, I don't know if any of you are YouTubers, but Aaron Raw is going to be speaking at Darwin Day along with some other cool people like Elizabeth Cromwell. So um, uh, please come to Darwin Day. It's at North Campus um, at, at Broward College. Um, and now I would like to uh, introduce a man named Alan Leipzig. He will be our moderator for this debate between Lance and Alex. Alan, Le Alan Leipzig was, ha um, is the Teacher of the Year for his uh, school, and he is one of the six finalists for Teacher of the Year of Broward College. He's an all-around awesome guy, and we are glad to have him moderating our debate today. So please welcome. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. My teaching instincts compel me to mention that please silence any electronic devices or cell phones, use a number two pencil, and there will be a quiz at the end of this. <laughs> you hear that? They think I'm kidding. Anyway, welcome to our first meeting of the minds debate between a speaker representing Calvary Chapel, Fort Lauderdale, 
and a speaker representing the Center for Inquiry and the, the Florida Atheist and Secular Humanists. I would also once again like to thank Darren Atinsky for arranging this, because Darren made it very clear that one of the things that keeps our country working is the exchange of ideas and the ability to talk about those ideas even when you disagree with people on the other side of those ideas. Now, for tonight's debate, we are going to be talking about the topic, is religion good for society? We are going to be having a traditional, what we call, Lincoln-Douglas debate. This is an old format as Lincoln does refer to Abraham Lincoln. I would like to remind everyone that, since this is a structured debate, even though you may feel very strongly about this, we would like to keep any applause, booing, lettuce, tomatoes, or pig's blood towards the end. We will have an informal Q&A afterwards, but please be respectful to the debaters during the formal debate, and you have plenty of time to speak to them afterwards. We will have two microphones at either side. I ask you now, and I will remind you, please be concise with your questions. I know many of you have stories or experiences that you'd like to share on this topic, but the more concise and short questions we can ask to our debaters, the more of you will be able to interact with them, the better this experience is going to be. Now, I would like to introduce our debaters on both sides. First, I would like to introduce our theist debater, Alex Loquet, who, having been vice president of two Fortune 500 companies, now is the president of Benchmark Custom Builders. He is going for his doctorate in business, and he has been interested in the field of Christian apologetics for 10 years. Having written two books, I'd like to plug at least one of them, Unveiling the Left, where he covers such diverse topics as society, culture, women's rights, and rap music. And I'd also like to mention that he has a Facebook page set up for this discussion. It is called God Topics as One Word. Now, can everyone please give me a warm round of applause for Alex O'Connor. And our atheist debater tonight will be Lance Bush, who has recently graduated summa cum laude with a bachelor's in psychology and philosophy. Lance is the co-founder and one of the current presidents of the Center for Inquiry Club, having recently published an article, well, in the, I make sure my handwriting's right. The Journal for Behavioral Sciences is in Terrorism and, my handwriting's terrible. The Journal for Behavioral Sciences of Terrorism and Political Aggression on the topic of how evolutionary psychology interacts with suicide terrorism. Let's all have a warm welcome for Lance. All right, here is how the debate format is going to work. In the traditional debate, the positive side, which will be Alex, starts with seven minutes. We've agreed for the purpose of tonight, we don't want to seem too breezy, Alex is going to start up with 15 minutes, and I will be up here keeping track of their time. In case they run over, I will not interrupt them. I will tell them at the end of their sentences. I'll be up here with my stopwatch as they go from making their case to questioning each other. The debate will run an associated 45 minutes. Afterwards, they will come down from their podiums. We'll have seats set up. We'll relax a little, and we will take as many questions as possible. So once again, I want to thank everyone who's involved in this, and I want to thank you for becoming interested in the most basic process of democracy, becoming an informed public. Thank you very much. Without further ado, we'll go Thank you all for being here. I want to start tonight with a story, something that happened to me um, last week, but it uh, really evolved over the course of the last six months. Um, about six months ago, I was on one of our construction jobs, and I walked into one of the rooms that was under construction, and I saw a group of uh, guys hanging drywall. And I heard a lot of hallelujahs and a lot of amen, so I started talking with them. It turns out that they were Christian, not Christian. We uh, went to lunch and uh, ended up with a friendship. So about a month ago, I had a drywall job come up in northern Florida, and I thought, who better to send, right? I can trust these guys, I know them. So I sent them on this job, and what was supposed to be a one-week job turned into a month of excuses, finger-pointing, change orders, and I seriously thought last week I was going to call Lance and switch positions with him. That's how frustrating that was. But the point is, is that tonight's debate is not whether 
there's good Christians or bad Christians, whether there's good atheists or bad atheists. We all know there's bad Christians. It's no secret. Um, the Crusaders come to mind. The Inquisitions come to mind. We all know there's bad atheists. Uh, Joseph Stalin comes to mind. Paul Pao, Mao Zedong, uh, Kim Jong-il. Um, today, tonight's debate is about which social philosophy provides the best framework for civil society and social progress. Which social philosophy provides the best framework for civil society and social progress? As for my drywallers, it was very likely that there was moral improvement there. I know one of them was a gang member. He's got all the tattoos to prove it. But Christianity did not help them learn how to dry, hang drywall. Now, I do not agree that all religions are good for society. Um, Hinduism comes to mind. Hinduism has what's called a caste system with four social categories. You're born into one, and you cannot move from one to another. Many economists believe that that has really hindered economic progress in India. Uh, on the other hand, if I wanted a peaceful religion, uh, I would probably nominate Buddhism as a very peaceful religion. We've seen historically how warring tribes have converted to Buddhism and uh, within one generation, we have very peaceful monks. Uh, Tibet comes to mind. Islam, if you look at the news, it appears to be hostile to democracy, while Christianity seems to favor it. So I think it's naive to lump all these, all religions into one category. These are very different ideologies with very different outcomes. I believe Christianity is as different from Islam as uh, atheism is uh, to Buddhism. Uh, Christ said, love your enemy. Muhammad said, pursue them with the sword. Uh, in India, they uh, worship cows. In America, we serve them up medium rare with A1 steak sauce. Now, this debate uh, is not new. This has been going on for centuries. You know, is Christianity good for society? Uh, is atheism good for society? Our founding father found themselves in that debate. And uh, here's where George Washington came down on the issue. On his farewell address, September 17, 17, 76, he, he uh, said these words, quote, of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. In vain would that man claim tribute to patriotism who, which, who should labor to subvert these great pillars of human happiness. Reason and experience both forbid us to expect that national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principles. Our founding fathers were so convinced that in the Northwest Ordinance, Article 3 states, religion, morality, and knowledge being necessary for good government and happiness, mankind, mankind, schools will forever encourage and teach such. That is, if you wanted to become a, new, a, a state in this new nation, you had to agree to the terms of the Northwest Ordinance, and it required that we taught religion to our children. Now, I'm gonna argue three points, or I'm gonna make three points, and I'm gonna argue the first two logically, and the third one empirically. In other words, what has history, history shown us? Point number one, Christianity is best for society because within Christianity, there's an incentive to be good. Within Christianity, there's an incentive to be good. And what is that incentive? There's a universal, transcendent moral law, don't lie, don't kill, don't steal, don't commit adultery, love your neighbor. And if that's not enough, God is watching. There's a universal moral law, God-given law, and God is watching. Imagine an atheist walking in a park one day, and I don't mean a, a Western atheist, which I call Christian atheist because they've been influenced by Christian virtues, I mean a pure atheist. And he's walking in the park one night, and he looks down and sees a wallet with $100 bills pouring out. Does the atheist give the wallet back? We don't know. We have no idea. He may be a good atheist. He may say, hey, you know, you should do good to other people and give the wallet back. He may be a pure evolutionist. Oh, well, I believe in survival of fittest. After all, this is going to help me survive. Now, same atheist, walking down the park one night, looks down, sees a wallet stuffed with $100 bills. Right before he picks it up, he remembers that there's a law that says you have to give wallets back if you find them. And then, as soon as he picks up the wallet, he looks up, and there's a video camera recording everything he's doing. Does he give the wallet back? We have no idea. We don't know. But it is more likely that he will give the wallet back, the second scenario, because there's an incentive to give the wallet back. 
Now, the problem with atheism is a universe that's strictly material, how could there be any transcendent moral law? Now, atheists knew they had a problem 30, 50 years ago and have all kinds of ideas of how to get to a moral law. And there's not one. There's logic. Some believe reason can take us there. Some believe society provides those laws to help us survive. Uh, others say that it's part of being this grand universe. Here's the problem. If you ask 10 atheists where the moral law came from, you get 10 answers. If you ask 10 atheists what the moral law is, once again, you get 10 different answers. On the other hand, if you ask a Christian where the moral law came from, they will all say the moral law came from God. If you ask 10 Christians what the moral law is, they'll all tell you the same thing, don't lie, don't steal, don't cheat, don't steal. So, when the Christian missionaries arrived in India uh, centuries ago and witnessed something called satai, that's wife burning, uh, when a man died, they would burn his wife at the stake so she would be with him in the afterlife. When they witnessed that, there was no moral dilemma. They didn't say, sit there and say, well, you shouldn't judge other people, or well, you've got to be tolerant to other people, or um, um, all cultures are equal. No, they looked at the situation and said, this is wrong, it is always wrong, and we have to stop it, and they did. So, point number one, Christians have an incentive to be good. Point number two, you can't judge an ideology by those who depart from it. You cannot judge an ideology by those who depart from it. I was driving in my car the other day, and I heard a story about a gay man who killed his gay lover in Los Angeles. This was actually two weeks ago. And you might have heard it. It made the news because he had dismembered all his body parts. And as most of you know, uh, Versace was murdered here in South Florida 10 or 15 years ago. How many believe we should outlaw the gay lifestyle or homosexuality because of those two murders and, and, and others? Anybody? Of course we shouldn't. And the reason why is because there's nothing inherent in the gay lifestyle that would lead someone to murder. There's nothing inherent. So the critics of Christianity, what do they do is they find people who have departed from the teachings of Christ and say, see, Christianity is bad, look what these people did. The problem with that is that there's nothing implicit in Christianity that would lead someone to murder or to burn witches. There's nothing implicit in the ideology. In other words, I've never heard an atheist say, hey, I'll tell you what, Christianity is bad for society and here's why, because I think it's good to commit adultery, I think it's good to lie, I think it's good to steal. I, I've never heard those arguments, right? They find someone who's departed and they say, look at this bad guy right here, he's a Christian. Okay, to truly win this argument, you have to show how the teachings of Christ, which many of us do follow, a lot of us don't burn witches, how those teachings enhance antisocial behavior. Now, the atheists have a response because the Christians do the same to the atheists. Hey, look at Stalin, look at Mao Zedong, look at Kim Jong-il, all atheists, right? Horrible murderers. And what do they say? Hey, there's nothing implicit in atheists. That's foul play. There's nothing implicit in atheism that would lead someone to be a mass murderer, which is true. The problem is there's nothing restricting the atheist either. There's, nothing, there's no conflict with his worldview when uh, Mao Zedong went on a killing spree. There's nothing. There's nothing. If he, if he believed in survival of the fittest, he was to survive. This is how we're going to do it. So, point number two was you can't judge an ideology by those who depart from it. Point number three. Western civilization is the product of Christian social philosophy. Let me say that again. Western civilization is the product of Christian social philosophy. Have you ever wondered why Western civilization has advanced above other civilizations? It's so ahead of other civilizations. And I don't mean that culturally. I mean it uh, scientifically. Over the last four or five hundred years, the greatest scientific discoveries have come from the West. I mean it politically. We, uh, we see that human rights emerged here, democracy emerged, emerged here in the West. Uh, economically, is this a coincidence? Is it really a coincidence? Because I, again, I've heard all kinds of arguments, and the most tenable one is the underlying ideology of the West, and that is Christianity. I want to mention a few points. 
Modern science, most historians, including Richard Dawkins, agree that the first 400 years of science history took place, which took us to the beginning of the 20th century, were driven by Christian men working under the biblical worldview. There was an incentive within Christianity to understand nature, and it's found in Romans chapter 1, verse 20. Public education, the first public schools in history, public schools open to the public, were monasteries which opened all over Europe. By, nine, by 797, uh, Charlemagne established schools at the highest, all the schools at the highest level of government when he said that priests shall establish schools in every town and village. The University of Paris, the first public university, we know as a result of three cathedral schools that came together. Oxford University, the result uh, of Robert Puller, a prominent theologian. In America, by the middle of the 19th century, there was 246 uh, universities in America, 17 were state institutions, and 229 were rooted in the Christian church. Um, Christian charity as a social virtue. It was Jesus who was the first to establish the poor as a social class, and since then you see the greatest charities in history are driven by Christianity. Uh, let, me, let me name a few. Red Cross, Compassion International, YMCA, Salvation Army, Christian Children's Fund, World Vision, just drive around your neighborhood, Holy Cross Hospital, Baptist Hospital, St. Jude's. Next point, is marriage as, a, as the most important social institution in history? For, uh, uh, marriage first emerged in the Hebrew text, and we know that the breakdown of the family can lead to every kind of social ill, including an increase in poverty, an increase in crime, drug use, suicide, teen pregnancy, and incarceration. And finally, human rights. Again, human rights. Take them for granted here in the West, but we know that the seeds of equality were born in the Hebrew text when God said, I've made man and woman in my image, putting every human being on the same playing field. Paul takes it a step further when he says, in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, slave or free. That was 2,000 years ago, and it took mankind quite a while to catch on. Let's look at a couple milestones to Magna Carta. We know this is the first move towards democracy at the highest level of government. It opens with, we in the presence of God and for the salvations of our soul and the souls of our ancestors to the honor of God and the exaltation of the Holy Church and amendment, and it goes on and on. Emancipation, we know what happened in Great Britain under William Wilberforce, a prominent minister in the United States. It happened through the worldview of Abraham Lincoln. Here's a quote from Abraham Lincoln, and I want to contrast it with what Darwin was doing at the very same time. What were atheists doing when emancipation was happening? Uh, quote from Abraham Lincoln, freedom is a natural condition of the human race in which the Almighty intended them to live. He opened the Gettysburg Address with four scores and seven years ago. Our fathers brought forth upon this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Uh, what was Darwin doing at the time? Descent of Man, published in 1871, Darwin wrote, at some future period, not very distant, as measured in centuries, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savage races of the world. At that time, apes will no doubt be exterminated. Uh, the break between man and his nearest allies will then be wider, for it will intervene between man and a more civilized state, as we may hope the Caucasian and some ape, as low as the baboon, instead of now, as between the Negro and the gorilla. Encyclopedia Britannica published in 1898 this, this uh, statement, by near the unanimous consent of anthropologists, this type occupies the lowest position in the evolutionary scale, the Negro, than any other races. Folks, emancipation would have never happened under the worldview of atheists because there's nothing inherent in atheism that suggests equality, nothing. On the contrary, look at the Super Bowl, we're not equal. I can't run as fast as those guys, I can't catch as good as them. You cannot uh, uh, extract from atheism the idea of equality. And with that, I will turn it over to Lance Bush. Thank you, Alex. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Lance will first... Give me some applause. Lance will first take the negative position. First, he will have seven minutes in which to examine Alex's position. After that, I will stop him. He will recast himself, and he will have eight minutes in which to set up his own points. So Lance, first you will have seven minutes for cross-examination, although there is to be no interaction until the speakers until the end of the debate. So you know, don't talk in between. And then we will have eight minutes for you to create your points. Are you ready? I'm ready. You may begin. All right, well, 
you know, it's an interesting thing because this actually happened just yesterday uh, where I was at the gym and I found a pile of cash on the ground. <laughs> uh, speaking I know of, you're a good atheist. <laughs> well, the funny thing was that uh, I, I picked this up and I went and turned it into the desk and I looked around for whose it might be and it didn't even occur to me really at the time that I could have kept it. So the question would be, well, why is that? Well, you know, the thing is that you've, you've made a claim that Christianity provides us with an incentive to do good, and you say that it has to do with the universal moral law, this notion that God is watching. Well, if that's the case, if it really is the case that Christianity provides us with these special incentives, we should expect this to have empirical results. In fact, we should, if we look out in the world, we should see Christians behaving more morally than non-Christians. Do we see this? No. Alex hasn't presented any evidence at all that Christians behave more morally than anybody else. Uh, and another point about this is that it doesn't even support his contention that Christianity is uniquely good. He's making the claim that Christianity is good, not that religion in general is good. And yet, these features are present in other religions. And there's really a point I wanted to make about his whole style of approach here, which is to basically throw every other religion under the bus, right from the get-go. He's not defending anything other than whatever he would claim Christianity is, even denominations that he doesn't agree with. So that's already conceding a lot of ground in my position to agree that all these different religions aren't even good. But I can grant him that if a religion is better than any secular alternative, then yeah, religion would be good for society. But the problem is, Alex has created a sort of false dichotomy. He's presenting Christianity as, and its rival, atheism. But is atheism, does it have any substance? Does it actually contain any elements, any features that would motivate people to act in a particular way? No. So I would agree with Alex that if someone was merely an atheist, they have no moral standards. But the problem is, I'm not here to defend atheism. Atheism is a starting point. It's a starting point, and after that, you develop values on top of that. There isn't an atheist around who simply doesn't have values, and if they do, I would object to them, you know, having no values. So really what we need here is a comparison between Christianity, or what Alex might argue is religion at its best, and some secular alternative at its best. And the question really ought to be, does Christianity do a better job of promoting the good society than that alternative? Now, Alex has claimed that you, uh, well, another claim is that you can't judge an ideology from those who depart from it. But this is a strange thing to make. It allows Alex to always modify his religion with hindsight to say, oh, well, no, my religion supported this all along. But I think we can all recognize that if it was 500 years ago, Alex might be up here quoting scripture in defense of slavery, in defense of oppressing women, uh, in defense of all manner of horrific things, uh, scientifically ridiculous things, like uh, geocentricity. Uh, so, I mean, this notion that, oh, well, you can't judge someone who departs from the scripture. Well, the bottom line is we don't get our morality from the Bible, not even Christians get it from the Bible. How would they ever judge it as good in the first place unless they were drawing on extra-biblical moral assumptions? I mean, after all, consider, ask yourselves, if you do believe that the Bible is a source of moral goodness that trumps your own intuitions, your own understanding of human compassion, human decency, well, suppose that we came across this passage that we didn't know about, and it unambiguously needed to be included in the Bible. It's canonical. It's really a part of the Bible. And suppose that this passage said something like, uh, that it's okay to commit rape, it's okay to steal, it's okay to do something horrific, would you then go, oh, well, because the Bible is true, the Bible is a source of universal moral law, I guess that's okay. I don't think so. I think we would all reject that. So what we can see is that uh, you don't get your morality from the Bible, and what we're doing is judging it in retrospect, in hindsight. Now, the last point I'm going to get to is this notion that uh, Christianity is, has produced Western civilization. Uh, first of all, I have questions about whether that, all of that's a good thing. I mean, Western civilization has been a bit of a double-edged sword. I mean, did Christianity produce uh, genocide of Native Americans? Did Christianity produce slavery? Uh, Alex doesn't want to take credit for the bad components that have come out of Christianity, but he will take uh, credit for the good components. And that doesn't seem fair. It doesn't seem right. Uh, but there's a problem with this argument, which is that just because Christianity supposedly led to some beneficial effects, doesn't mean that it considered by itself is good. Uh, consider World War II. World War II had all these 
massive residual benefits. We had advances in medicine and technology and science. But in the end, was World War II on its own a good thing? No. It was a bad thing. What Alex would have to show is not that Christianity gave us stuff that's good on its own, science, things like that, but that Christianity systematically produces good things in a way that's better than a secular alternative. But once we have these products of Christianity that are good, what do we need Christianity for? Alex would have to make that case. In fact, he would have to make the case that in the absence of Christianity, things would get worse. And he hasn't presented any evidence of that at all. But consider these things, that Christianity gave us modern science. This is just not true. Uh, I mean, much of the elements of science were developed long before Christianity was around. Uh, Aristotle paved a lot of the way. Uh, Al-Hazen, a Muslim scholar, actually articulated a scientific method very similar to what we have today. Uh, so the sources, the, the roots of modern science and of human rights and all these things uh, have numerous uh, components to them, numerous influences, and to, to claim that Christianity is responsible for them is overly simplistic. It's not true to the actual history. Uh, now, with respect to human rights, uh, human rights was not a product of Christianity. Human rights was a reaction to Christian authority. Uh, actually, uh, the historian Michelin O'Shea, she's an expert on human rights, has said that what the human rights movement started as was a deliberate attempt to secularize Judeo-Christian ethics. What philosophers were trying to do is to extract the ethical principles from Christianity and find a foundation for them in something other than Christianity. And in fact, they did so. Uh, some of them, like John Locke, would claim that, it, that these principles did come from God, but many others argued that they did not come from God, and that's the legacy we're left with today. Uh, so, that'll do it. Okay. Thank you, Lance. You've had your second. Yeah, they're both great. I need to remember to wait for that applause, because I'm sure it's going to come every time. You've had your seven-minute negative cross to examine Alex's points. Now you will have eight minutes to present your own negative argument and to create your own points. After which, Alex will have the opportunity to ask questions. So let me reset my stopwatch, and you may begin when ready. All right. Um, all right. So uh, now I'm going to argue that not just that Alex's points are kind of off, that they're mistaken, but that religion is in fact bad for society. Now, why? Well, we never even really discussed what it meant for something to be good for society. What does that mean? Well, when we talk about what's good for society, I would think that what's good is the promotion of human values, things that we all collectively value, things like liberty, happiness, joy, contentment, basically things that you could wrap up into a package and call well-being. Even if we don't agree in the particulars, the general idea is the things that we all care about. Now, once you admit this, once you admit the good of society has something to do with what we want, the things that we want, it becomes a matter of discovery to find out what actually promotes human well-being. And what are the tools that we use to discover things? Well, I believe that the only tools that we really have available are reason and evidence. And once this is the case, we can examine Christianity, we can examine any other point of view, and actually look at the evidence to see whether or not uh, that worldview actually promotes well-being. So, why is Christianity a problem? Why is any religion a problem? Well, the problem is that these religions are premised on faith. They're premised on unjustified belief. Now, someone might say, oh, well, faith is consistent with reason. I don't believe that that's the case. There are, every religion contains these elements of the supernatural. Uh, they contain absurd claims that there's no rational evidential appeal to, uh, the virgin birth, uh, Adam and Eve, there's no evidence for these claims. These are claims that are accepted on faith. Now you might ask, why is that a problem? Isn't faith a good thing? Well, faith, uh, I'm not talking about just faith that maybe your child will, will make it through an illness or something like that. I'm talking about accepting as true propositions that have enormous consequences for how you view the whole world. And these consequences matter. They're, they matter with respect to the production of human well-being. The problem with faith is that once you accept something in faith, once you think that that's a viable strategy for ascertaining what you ought to do, you let go of all standards. You let go of any connection between what your beliefs are 
and actually mapping reality as it is. In other words, you sever the anchor between beliefs and reality. Now, this can allow for people to do amazing things that they never would have done. I'm granted that. People have acted on faith to promote charitable causes and do great things, but they've also promoted some of the worst things that have ever happened in the world. So I'm going to give you a brief list of just the things that have been justified in account of faith. Faith has condoned in its time on earth uh, the divine right of kings, feudalism, caste systems, slavery, unjust executions, child labor, human and animal sacrifice, stoning heretics, oppression of women, disregard for animal welfare, destruction of the environment, cannibalism, taboos against contraception, which have exacerbated life-destroying epidemics all over the world, maiming and butchering children, genocide, murder, pillaging, theft, persecution, pointless wars, torture, terrorism, pretty much anything horrible you can think of has been justified on account of faith. Now, Alex would turn and tell you, ah, but these people departed from the ideology I faith. Well, Alex's ideology might happen to be good for the world, but why is that? Would Alex have held this ideology 500 years ago? Maybe not. And if Alex does hold the ideology he does, we can ask, why? Does he have a defense for it? Does he have a rationale for it? I don't know. Because once you accept something on faith, anything is possible. Now, and that's why Stephen Weinberg said, uh, with or without religion, you have good people doing good things and bad people doing bad things. But to have good people do bad things, that takes religion. But just consider examples of actions justified on account of faith. Uh, September 11th. Uh, many people would attribute political uh, bases to what the hijackers did, but the best explanation for what they did is that they really had faith that they were doing the will of Allah. And it doesn't matter whether they were right or not. Once you believe something like that, once you believe something on faith, it can override all our natural impulses, all our natural moral motivations, uh, compassion, all of these things. By the desire to do the will of some being that may or may not even exist, I mean, I think it takes a special sort of person who can celebrate murdering their own daughter because she shamed their family. And yet, these kind of actions are justified on account of faith. Consider one example today, the Catholic Church. Now, the Catholic Church has protected hundreds, thousands of child rapists from prosecution. They've funneled countless millions of dollars to pay off families. Uh, and they've done this, why? Well, who knows why? But the bottom line is, they haven't been brought to justice anywhere near as much as they would have, where they're not this divine mantle of protection, protecting them from justice. And that's what's protecting them, is people's respect for religion, people's notion that faith somehow is such an intrinsic virtue that it overrides everything and it blinds people to the reality of what we're dealing with, that these people have spread enormous suffering all over the world, and yet people are placing their moral views not grounded in the real world, in real human suffering, but in these notions of God and divine mandates and all sorts of things that these people have no evidence for. And it's just, it's a ridiculous thing. So, lastly, I wanted to consider uh, the differences between secular societies and religious societies. Now, I mean, this is one very easy way to see whether religion is good for society, is to actually look out the world and see what, what are the differences between religious societies and non-religious societies? And virtually every study shows that on almost every account, uh, religious indivi uh, non-religious individuals, uh, just you know, to go off of a list, uh, people that possess no religion tend on average to be less nationalistic, less prejudiced, less anti-Semitic, less racist, less dogmatic, less ethnocentric, less close-minded, less authoritarian. Uh, studies even found that during the Holocaust, the more secular a person was, the more likely they were to protect uh, Jews from Nazis. Uh, also, if you look at studies on the differences in well-being between societies, uh, almost every metric uh, of well-being shows that secular societies, the people are better off. Uh, just to see we have a higher well-being, life expectancy, infant mortality, economic equality, economic stability, health care, standard of living, education quality, uh, self-reported happiness, security, absence of crime, lack of corruption, all of these are higher in secular nations. Now, does this show that secular nations, like becoming more secular causes these things? No. 
But what it does show is that it's completely consistent with society becoming better, being a good society, to have no religion in it. And this shows us that maybe we don't need religion. In fact, what a lot of these studies find is that the real causal relationship very likely is economic instability and how poorly off the country is. In other words, the worse off the country is, the greater the degree of religion. And once you provide people with the things that they need, religion falls by the wayside. So it would be very strange to argue for religion if religion only seems to maintain itself when society is badly off. Because if you're going to try to keep something that correlates with how badly society is, well, it's, it's a strange thing because maybe you're going to be hindering the real things that really make society better. Things like improving our health care, things like providing education for everybody. Thank well, you, Mr. Bush. Okay. Okay, for our next segment, Alex will get three minutes in order to ask Lance questions on his points. Lance will remain quiet while he listens to Alex's questions. And then Lance will have four minutes on his own to respond to Alex's questions. So, Alex, you may begin with three minutes. Three minutes? Three minutes. Okay. I will only give you the one minute mark for this one. Okay. Um, first off, I want to uh, say that I did not just take credit for the bad, I took credit for the bad. I mentioned the Inquisitions and the Crusades, things that happened a thousand years ago and still come up uh, now. But um, um, truly, the last century was the bloodiest in human history. 200 million people died in the hands, not of religious people, not of religious people, most of them to the hands of atheists. And so this notion that religion and all this violence and, and what have you, Less than 3% of wars in history were purely religious. Look at history properly and you'll see that, and, and uh, far less were due to Christianity. Uh, so I'm done with that argument. Every study shows that secular societies, it's funny, I wasn't gonna, I wasn't gonna dispute this because I don't, I didn't really know, but uh, Stossel, John Stossel's running something right now, I saw it Sunday, that says, uh, they had people about, uh, experts on human happiness, they looked at all the studies, and they said it was religion, and charity that made people happy. These were the two factors that made people happy, and studies also show that religious people are more charitable. If the subject is about uh, improving society, charity is one of those measures that matter. Uh, the scientific process, you said that this was Galileo, or I'm sorry, you said it was uh, Aristotle. I was talking about the modern scientific process, the inductive process. This happened uh, under, um, uh, well, uh, I can't remember right now, but the, the inductive method happened in Europe, and uh, it was a product of uh, Christianity. Uh, so I'm talking about modern science, not, uh, not ancient science. Christianities are not better. Now, let me say this. I never claimed that Christians were perfect. Never. And I, and I know they're not. I've been a Christian 20 years. I've never been perfect. I've made lots of mistakes. The question of this debate, though, is has there been moral improvement? in my life or the life of those who become Christians. And I say visit any church. Every church I've gone into for the last 20 years, all I hear about is how people's marriages got healed, how people got delivered from drugs, from all kinds of addictions. There's been moral improvement. Not that we're perfect, is that this Christianity provides that incentive for moral improvement. Now you, 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 you seem to only say that the religious people have faith, but let me tell you something, when Carl Sagan says something like the universe is all there is, the universe is all there was, the universe is all there ever will be. That's a faith statement. Just like in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. We don't know how the universe began. We know what happened 13.7 billion years ago. We know what happened in an instant, but we don't know how. And so I can ask Lance, I'm gonna ask you five questions right now and just listen to what a faith statement sounds like. And here's my five questions for you, Lance. How did the universe begin? Why do molecules bind? Where did the laws of nature come from? How did we get consciousness? How did we get consciousness from non-conscious matter? How did the eye evolve? How do you explain the Cambrian explosion fossils? Mr. Lopez? Yes, sir. I will have to stop you okay. at that point. Okay. At this point, Alex, er, thank you. Lance, you will have four minutes to respond. After which, we will go to Alex's closing statement and then Lance's closing statement, each of which will be four minutes long. Lance, you may begin your four-minute response when ready. 
All right, well, the answer to the first four of those uh, four questions is very easy. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, and I don't know. <laughs> yeah, the position I favor starts with doubt. It starts with acknowledging that you don't know everything that there is to know about the world. Uh, that's where I start, and I don't know the answers to these questions. All of these questions are irrelevant. They have nothing to do with whether or not religion is good for society. I don't have to maintain any position about these at all, and if I did have one, what possible implications could it have? I mean, I suppose understanding the origins of consciousness might help us in some way, but insofar as we discover those facts, then we will modify our ethical system if it's a secular one accordingly. I mean, that's one of the advantages of having a secular system, a secular ethical system, that you can incorporate new knowledge into it. I mean, what if we discovered uh, that there was no free will? How would, this, how would this have implications for Christianity? It seems like it would undermine a lot of it. And yet, this would be a problem for me because I go, oh, okay, well I guess we need to adjust our ethics accordingly. Um, Alex actually made a few comments that I wanted to respond to, uh, so I wanted to respond to those. Uh, he claimed that he was only referring to the inductive process as being a product of science. Well, Alhazen, uh, who I mentioned previously, who had formalized a scientific method, was actually, he actually influenced Roger Bacon, who was one of the Western advocates of science, and was cited by Kepler as being a major influence. The bottom line is that it was the Greeks and Romans who influenced the Muslims, who in turn influenced Christians when they brought their work over and translated it. To say that Christianity is good for society because it gave us modern science, well, is Greek society good? Should we go back to looking like Spartans and throw spears at one another? Uh, I mean, it's ridiculous to say that. Uh, also, uh, to say that Sagan made some comment, why would I have to agree with Sagan about something? Maybe he does accept something on faith. Uh, I don't accept anything on faith. Uh, you've also claimed that charity uh, makes people, uh, that charity is one of these things that's higher among Christians. Well, in secular societies, they actually, people are much more likely, if they're secular, first of all, to vote for candidates who favor redistributive measures. And secular societies give the most foreign aid out in the world. So this kind of conflicts with that claim. Also, uh, atheists have been increasing in the number of charitable donations that they made in recent years. And we have to wonder whether really the lack of involvement they've had in charities because it's you know, frequently gone under the radar, or because they've had a lack of the means and social networks to really pump them up and do it. Once they're available, atheists are shooting at the top of many charitable things. Uh, Kiva is a microloan website. Atheists uh, were on the top last year. Uh, so we're seeing much more in the way of atheist uh, charity. Uh, as far as the Cambrian explosion, uh, I, there are a bunch of problems with that claim. I mean, the biggest one is that uh, Christians will say that, oh, well, there was a sudden explosion. Uh, I mean, Alex didn't go into details about it. But the problem with this notion that the camp, well, you know what? I don't even think I need to address it because it's also off topic, but you know what, I'll address it anyway. <laughs> I mean, just to show that... Please, audience. Uh, uh, well, the Cameron explosion, uh, there's so many problems wrong with the, the claim. I mean, for one thing, what Christians will tell you is all these major phyla appear in the Cambrian explosion. Well, how do we know that all these different phyla appear? It presumes that we can identify through comparative morphology that these are different species to begin with, that these are different foundations for the different phyla. Uh, so the whole notion that all these different species suddenly arise there kind of presumed the validity of evolution in the first place. Also, it took place over some 10 to 30 million years. It was no explosion by ordinary circumstances. Mr. Bush, at this point, I will have to draw to your close a response. And now, Alex, when ready, you can begin your four-minute closing remarks. I, by the way, I mentioned the five questions, Lance, because once again, you've said that only religious people have faith, and I think listen, it requires faith to be in that, to be uh, an atheist, because logic tells us you cannot affirm a negative in the absolute. That is to say, if I said there is a red pen somewhere in the neighbor, in, in the universe, all I have to do is find one red pen, and my statement becomes true. But to say there's no red pens anywhere in the, in the, in the universe, there's no red pens, I would have to look everywhere and look everywhere in the universe before I can say there are no red pens anywhere in the universe. So this, the claim itself that there is no God is a faith statement. It, 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 it relies on a major assumption. So, um, 
Going back to my original four points, once again, there is an incentive within Christianity to be good. I never claim that you become perfect or you're not going to do bad things anymore, but you will make moral improvements. As I see people, as they draw closer to Christ, as they see God, you see this moral improvement.